and sit over on the corner, but that's uh, a good justification because I'm not the important people, oh, not the important person here. The people to my left are. Uh, welcome to this uh, first panel, Advancing Athlete Power. I'm sure you'll agree with me. A uh, big congratulations to Jens and the organizers for putting together such a fantastic panel to start the, uh, this session off. Um, as you can see, it's a, a multi-stakeholder panel. The problem of advancing athlete power is a very complex one. It cuts across disciplinary boundaries. It's an ethical problem, a philosophical problem, a legal problem, a problem of representation and politics. So we have a, a group of speakers here who I think are going to try to address the issue in the round, but what's obvious, I think, from the start is that they're not going to agree with each other, at least not totally, and we don't want that. I hope there's going to be no uh, uh, kicking, biting, or uh, fighting. I'll try to be an impartial referee, because in this topic, it's very difficult to be independent and impartial. Nobody, be, nobody can be both inside and outside of the game. And it's clear that uh, although it's very easy to set up ethical problems in binaries, you're either for or you're against, or uh, this is such a complicated problem. But I hope that we can find some synergies. I hope that we can find some shared spaces, as well as some fruitful conflict. So uh, the, the, the protocol is going to be uh, each of the speakers will introduce themselves very briefly. They'll talk for a maximum of six minutes. I'm going to try to keep them honest in terms of time so that the first half of the session should be their own perspectives of advancing athlete power. And then I'm really hoping they've stimulated you well enough to get a 40-minute conversation. We're going, to minute, we're going to finish five minutes early. But uh, don't let me down. We'll have a good time for discussion, and I hope that uh, we make some progress at the first day and the first panel session that we have. So I'm going to invite uh, the first uh, speaker, Han Zhao, to offer his thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Han. Uh, I'm the chair of the United States Athletes Commission. Uh, prior to that, I was a table tennis athlete. Uh, I served on the board of USA Table Tennis for eight years, and I've been on our Athletes Commission uh, for the last seven years. Uh, and today I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the uh, issues that I've seen with athlete representation in my experience serving as an elected athlete representative and um, sort of note some, some ways that I see bridging the gap uh, between sport organizations and athlete advocates. Uh, and I really wanted to center the focus around, uh, we have a saying here that uh, you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Um, but in my experience, more and more athletes do want to know how the sausage is made and want to participate in that process because I think as sport has grown uh, over the last few decades to a point where the sport organizations are more and more corporatized, uh, athletes have noticed that more and more decisions that affect them are being made at levels below the board and the general governance level. Uh, so many of our athlete representatives are engaging primarily with people who are working in governance or people at the executive level, uh, so board of directors or, or the CEO of their sport organization, whether that's an NOC or an NF. Uh, and a lot of the time, the decisions that impact the individual athletes are not me being made at that level. So when we've seen athlete uh, voices communicating with those people, uh, we've noticed that sometimes people are talking past each other. And one of the issues is that uh, the people who they're interacting with are often looking at things from a systemic top-down level, whereas the athlete voices are very much looking at things from a bottom-up perspective. Uh, so common things that you might hear athletes uh, talk about are uh, resource allocation and Rule 40 and things like that and how you know, that the, the individual athlete on the ground is not getting the support that they need or they feel like they deserve. Or when you're talking about anti-doping, uh, or you know, sexual abuse in some of these countries, uh, what about the arbitration process or the dispute resolution <coughs> process not working for the individual athlete? Whereas a lot of the decision makers are looking at things from the overall systemic perspective, uh, 
you know, with Rule 40, we need to look at solidarity funding. With other resource allocation questions, we're looking at, okay, this is a zero-sum game of the whole pie, uh, and we are providing a great deal of indirect athlete support across a lot of different areas. And so the parties oftentimes end up talking past each other. I think uh, we really do need more engagement of athletes uh, at sort of the mi middle tiers of people who are making those sort of intermediate decisions and who can engage with athletes on how some of those lower level decisions are getting made that are affecting those athletes day to day, which has been really challenging because a lot of our athletes commissions, for example, and other athlete organizations are, are driven completely by volunteers. So there's very limited time, there's limited capacity uh, and limited capabilities for those organizations. Uh, another sort of very uh, related issue is the fact that because a lot of these uh, athlete organizations are volunteer organizations, we find that we're being engaged in efforts sort of up front and, and at the end, but in the middle where a lot of the work is losing traction and we're losing sort of visibility into what's being, what's being uh, done to drive some of the initiatives that we've put forward. Uh, so a good example in the, in the United States uh, was that uh, our athletes commission, people started making comments that although sort of, uh, st staff and administrator salaries had been increasing pretty steadily over the last couple of decades, the medal bonuses for athletes had not been increasing. So the board took that input and they said, well, we're gonna increase medal bonuses 50% 50, uh, 50 across the board for all athletes, which was great, except for the fact that in implementing this and, and voting on this, there was a lack of engagement with the athlete represent representatives and they failed to note that there was already a significant discrepancy between able-bodied and Paralympic athletes. So without the athlete input in that process, they essentially widened the gap between able-bodied and Paralympic athletes, which unsurprisingly the Paralympic athletes were not very happy with. Um, so both the, the, both the issues that I've talked about can be solved, I think, by allowing athlete uh, athlete voices and athlete advocates to become more integrated in that sausage making pro process where the work is actually being done, where some of those lower level decisions are being made and allowing them to influence that and not just you know, be, have some voice or have some influence at the top levels. And in the United States, we're really trying to push a path forward of how do we professionalize uh, athlete advocacy and athlete voices moving forward? Uh, how do we give them the resources and the expertise and the time in order to make these uh, contributions toward the sport organizations and to bridge that gap a little bit. So it's really encouraging for me to see you know, Global Athlete, Athletes Can, Germany, some of these other uh, countries moving in that direction. Certainly a great priority for us. So I just wanted to leave you guys with those observations and I'm uh, really open and interested in, in discussing not only with the panel but many of you here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. You're obviously a two-time role model, not just as an Olympian, but you stayed within time. So. <laughs> Let's make sure everybody else does the same. So a couple of quick issues there then. The just allocation of resources, who gets what, who decides, on what basis. And you made me think of a really good question that I hadn't considered. How do you prepare someone to be an athlete advocate? Thank you very much. James. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming along. I'm delighted to be here. James Tompkins from Australia. Um, Olympics are in my blood. I've been to six Olympic Games uh, from 1988 to 2008. And in 2012, elected onto the IOC Athletes Commission. So, 31 years have been involved in the Olympics. And uh, I've got three gorgeous girls, three children, and I've, they've been brought up under the values of Olympism very, very strictly. Uh, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> I was the only one that laughed. <laughs> yeah. No, no, about uh, respect and always striving. I think that is really, really key and a balance in life, and I think we're going to touch on it in later sessions around the athlete balance, and I think that's really, really critical. Mind, body and soul. Athletics for the body, academics for the mind, and you know, arts for the soul, and I think that's really, really key. And, and I think all of our discussions today and over the next few days should, be, uh, should revolve around those values, those values of, we all know the values of sport, and I'm sure there's going to be um, uh, disagreements along the way and, and different points of view, but we're all here because we love sport and we love the values of sport. And as long as that uh, remains the fundamental, that's key. I thought I'd just give a little bit of context to uh, the IO, IOC Athletes Commission, just a little bit of um, history, just so that uh, like any athletic performance, 
we're always striving. We're always striving to do better and always evolving. And sometimes, um, uh, well, that should always be the case. And the IOC Athletes Commission is an example of that. It was established in 1981. Uh, a group of athletes got together. They were appointed. Um, that was the first meeting, uh, not that long ago. In 94, it was the first time that athletes were actually elected onto the Athletes Commission. So straight away we have elections where peers are, are electing their own representatives. Uh, in 2000, though that, those athletes that were elected became IOC members. And uh, certainly, you know, to your point, uh, had a vote at the highest level, um, but it's taken quite a while before we've infiltrated into those, into those um, um, uh, intermediate levels. 2002, which we brought, or I wasn't there, but the first International Athletes Forum occurred where, we, where the Athletes Commission tried to get all of the athlete leaders from around the world together, uh, introduced various programs, the Athlete Career Program, uh, 2014 Agenda 2020, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of that, uh, where you know, athletes were the centre of every decision. Um, that's the goal. Metal, um, so, and then, I guess the, the highlight or um, the end point um, so far was this year, our Athletes Forum in Lausanne earlier in the year where we had uh, almost 300 odd athlete leaders, uh, stakeholder leaders in one room discussing all the issues and forming a, an agenda to move forward into the, into the next decade. So that's a little bit of the history. As I said, we're always constantly trying to evolve, trying to improve, just like our athletic performance when we were competing. Um, so we're elected by our peers. I think that's really, really key. If we're going to be athlete representatives, we need to be elected by, by our peers. Um, we're not, we want to reflect diversity and, and reach across all of the regions. And there's such a huge disparity. We're trying to, rep, you know, we're trying to represent 207 National Olympic Committee athlete, um, athlete commissions, all the way from the US down to, uh, from my area, David Howman's area in, in Oceania, uh, tiny little Oceanian nations um, who have you know, have hardly got the internet, let alone uh, a formal athlete commission. So there's a huge range of, of complexity and competence as well, and we're trying to empower, empower them. Uh, within the Athlete Commission, we have liaisons with the International Paralink Committee, the World Olympians Association, and more, and quite recently, the Continental Athlete Commissions. So we're trying to, you know, communication, I'm going to be fascinating to hear about communication strategies, uh, effective communication strategies, trying to filter the message down to the other athlete commissions, but also hear what those commissions are, um, are are driving, and that's where the forum was, was so key earlier in the year. Um, so not only are there 15 athletes on the IOC, the same number as presidents of international federations, the same number as presidents of national Olympic committees, so there's quite a good balance, balance there. But outside of those 15 athletes on the AC, there's another 30 odd Olympic athletes that are IOC members as well. So athletes, there is very, very good representation throughout um, the IOC. And to your point of, of infiltrating the middle, levers, middle layers of decision making, the Athletes Commission members are on pretty much all of the commissions within the IOC. So we try not to commentate on decisions, we try and be involved in the actual decisions and help shape those decisions. And I sit on the program commission, which um, looks at what sports come in and come out of the games. And it's uh, it's fascinating. So to be able to uh, to for all of the athletes to have a seat at that table and help shape those decisions is really really key. On top of that, we're in coordination commissions, uh, working groups, and um, uh, for example, uh, one of our members is the the chair of the organising commission for the, uh, the Lausanne 2020 Youth Olympic Games. So we're trying to do our best. We're trying to infiltrate uh, those middle layers, and I think it's really, really key. And we're all we're all here because we know the importance of athletes' voices. 
We probably all think of different ways of doing it, but as long as we all remember that the, the voice of the athlete is absolutely paramount, I think that's, that's key. Thank, Thank you, James. You. Uh, the phrase, the voice of the athlete, is of course a slightly ambiguous one because I suspect there isn't one, there are an awful lot, and they're not awfully singing in tune most of the time, I guess. But uh, thank you for that, uh, laying out the structure and processes of, of, of one athlete representation uh, body, that's great. You did say something about infiltration a few times, and it, it did make me wonder about the issue of one, uh, great that your peers vote you in, but how do you know what they want? How do you systematically go and canvas what their views and values are and, and frankly how do you filter between the good views and values and the bad ones that would be an interesting thing and be really interesting to try and find out how you're held to account by them so so you've raised a, a good chunk of issues there thank you very much uh, let's move on to Brendan thanks Mike uh, my name is Brendan Schwab everyone I'm the executive director of the World Players Association I'm going to speak briefly on the essentials of collective uh, athlete or player uh, representation. And as we're in America and we're in the home of baseball, I'm going to introduce you to a man named Marvin Miller, who many say that next to Babe Ruth and Jackie Robinson was the most influential person in the history of baseball, certainly in the business of baseball. And he's the founding executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association. Uh, Marvin clearly understood that athletes are people first, players second, and that sport for many is work. And of the 85,000 athletes that we represent in more than uh, 60 countries, some 120 player associations, it is indeed work and precarious work for many. James also spoke about the fact that athletes are world class, certainly at, at the level he's, he's competed at. And I think Marvin Miller is our example of a world class champion of athlete representation. Marvin was never accepted into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame because of his commitment to the players, but he was asked what his legacy piece would be, and he described it in the following terms. He was the leader of the first true union in the history of the game, and working closely with the players, he helped form the structure of what has been termed one of the strongest and the best unions in the country. And contrary to certain beliefs, the arrival of the Players Union coincided with and was instrumental in the greatest prosperity and the expansion that the game has ever seen. And that's the impact of our movement in giving players an equal say since the 1960s. There's been enormous growth in player associations. Around the time Marvin first emerged on the scene, there was less than 25 in the world. Uh, in the mid-90s, with the growth of full-time professionalism, we saw a massive growth from between 40 and 60. And the reason we're here today is there's now some 160 player associations uh, seeking to influence the way in which their sport is run and the terms and conditions upon which players are employed. The achievement, the track record of the player association movement goes well beyond wanting to sit on a board or sit on a committee or be a part of the decision-making process. There's a dedication to having an equal say. The achievements include the abolition of a maximum wage, the abolition of the transfer and retain system, achieving a share of television rights, revenue sharing, grievance resolution, collective bargaining, free agency, the growth in the movement itself, a huge investment in player development and wellbeing because we know how precarious and short-term the career is, and that we need to ensure that athletes can transition successfully once their playing days are over. The huge investment in player health and safety as we deal with uh, challenging issues such as concussion and head injury. And of course, these growth in economic benefits for the players have coincided with enormous drive in growing the economic benefits for sport. So what does that mean? It means we want an equal say and progress has to be achieved through building leverage for collective bargaining, which means entering into legally binding agreements with the sports bodies, the leagues and the employers. Now, athletes need to be effectively represented, able to contract through their own representative body with the sports. And this is something that simply cannot be achieved through internal governance mechanisms. And a collective bargaining agreement really involves three things. The first is a shared vision for the sport. 
The second is mutual trust and confidence so that players understand the sport and where the sport needs to go and the sport understands what it means to be an elite player. And the third thing, of course, is um, change, the ability to deal with change and, uh, and that requires mutual trust and, to repeat, confidence, respect and trust across the bargaining table. So what are the essentials of effective player representation? We believe there are five. As we sit down and try and turn the discussion into practical outcomes on how athlete voice can be heeded. The first is there must be a representative body that is owned and accountable to the players, a membership-based organisation. That body must be able to appoint its own leadership and representatives without any interference from any external party, including the sports. The players have to have equal access to the information which guides the decision-making processes of the sport. We need to understand the business. We do need to understand the vision, the big picture, as well as the small. The organisation needs to be financially independent. And finally, and to repeat, it needs to have the capacity to organise, bargain and enter into binding agreements on behalf of their membership. What are the responsibilities of the sports governing bodies, particularly at the global level, in this context? They're clear. The first is to uphold their corporate responsibility to respect internationally recognised human rights, and that includes the rights of athletes to freedom of association. That includes the right to form and join trade unions and at the global level for those associations to form an international federation. So the essence of this is there's no substitute for active engagement and negotiation by sports governing bodies with player associations. Commissions and committees can potentially be a useful tool where athletes are not represented. However, they cannot provide the same level of protection and empowerment of the full re realisation of trade union rights. And uh, I'll just pause on the thought that um, if we look back to where sport was in the 70s and the 80s, and we've, we had this understanding that there is a voluntary assumption of risk in participating in sport, and that sport, uh, and that risk is to be borne by the athletes. As we pause and we now move forward, we understand that placing that risk on the athletes has been the cause of immense and devastating harm. Thank you very much, Brendan. That's a, a perfect line to interrupt you on. Uh, Thanks, so, thank you very much for drilling down into some of the key economic issues that flow from the political obligations and rights. Perfect. Over to Morris. Thank you, Mr. McNamee. Um, dear co-athletes, dear co-athlete representatives, um, dear co-sports representatives in a wider sense, my name is Moritz Geisreiter. I'm from Germany, and I used to be a nice speed skater in winter sports. Um, and now it's, a, it's an honor for me to be here and represent um, Athleten Deutschland translated into English, Athletes Germany, the new um, athletes representative body from Germany here at the 2019 Play the Game conference. Um, I would like to introduce to you as a specific example of uh, maybe modern, at least for us, new version of athletes representation, uh, what Athleten Deutschland, what Athletes Germany is. Um, and to keep it nice and simple and nice and short, especially, I would like to mainly talk about our establishment, our growth, Second, our wins that we can look back on so far, um, and the objectives for the near future that we are aiming for. Talking about our establishment and our growth, um, we are founded by and, is, uh, and uh, elected by athletes. So we are an independent association that still has strong ties uh, to, the, to the athletes commission within the, the NOC in Germany, which is called the OSB. So, um, we are the elected athletes commission and the very same group of people has then founded and so formed uh, Athleten Deutschland with the benefits of being more independent there and being able to um, address issues and questions that we were not able to address and um, express before, also within Germany. Um, we definitely benefited from a certain zeitgeist that was, that was to be noted, uh, that is still to be noted in these days the zeitgeist of uh, the athletes' emancipation. And we have by now reached a situation um, in which we, with the new association Athleten Deutschland, are government funded, um, to be more precise by the German Bundestag and the Ministry of the Interior. 
um, talking about our wins, our humble wins so far. Um, primarily, we managed to establish our association, and that's one of the major wins for us so far already. Um, we, have, uh, we have safe fundings, um, and we have become the primary voice of athletes vis-a-vis -vis politics and media. So that is something, I think. Um, we can talk in the name of the athletes, and we are being addressed when people want to talk to the athletes and ask the athletes. Um, we have also had an intense and are still having an intense discussion about IOC Rule 40 in Germany. And we, I would say, thanks to our contribution, we have seen uh, discussions about this issue and also first steps in terms of relaxation of the rule for German athletes at first and now also athletes of the United States. Um, and not to be forgotten, we have also seen structural reforms within the German army. German army, to be explained, is a strong supporter of um, German top athletes too. And um, we have criticized the structures that they were providing and they, in the in a, in a reaction, um, worked on those structures. That was good for us to see as well. Our objectives, talking about what we are planning uh, on doing next. First off, um, we will try to to strengthen our association, our organization from the inside. Furthermore, we are acquiring, uh, we are working for more members, official members. We are strengthening our partnerships in Germany and internationally. We're networking heavily these days and months and um, that's a great experience to see that other nations, other athletes commissions are talking in the same language as we are. Um, besides that, besides working uh, from the inside, we're gonna we're going to focus on, on the goal, on the long-term goal, goal of installing a situation where the athlete's, um, let's say, athletic performance is just as much valued as his personal development and his, pers his person, basically the person of the athlete. So we're talking about dual career chances here, about the fact that an athlete um, also stays an Olympian or an athlete in general beyond his career, his or her career. And last but not least, we will um, try to network and push forward the discussion about possible um, changes in IOC Rule 40. That's also uh, an issue that we're gonna keep on working on. So in general, that's put in a really small nutshell what Athleten Deutschland is. Athleten Deutschland, the independent voice of athletes in Germany that we have introduced, founded 2017, so only two years old. Um, and I'm looking forward to hear and get to know new people, new opinions here, um, and I'm happy to discuss um, several ideas m that maybe also differ from ours, um, and keep it coming. Thank you very much to the Play the Game conference for having us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> one, one key point you've picked out there which hasn't been addressed yet is this, what's the space for athlete power in between those sports which are part funded by governments and states parties and those which are commercially driven. What does athlete power look like under those circumstances and indeed at the interfaces between them? Thank you very much. Emma. Thank you. So my name is Emma Terho. I'm a five-time Olympian in ice hockey. I come from Finland. Spent my college years here in the US. I played four years for the Ohio State University. And after that, I played in the Finnish National League and also in a pro league in Russia. So I've seen quite a few ways of doing things, which I think is a helpful tool or helpful experience to be able to use right now. From here, Colorado Springs, I'm happy to be in this conference. I have really good memories from the place. Last time I was here, we were in our pre-camp before the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games, which was one of the top of my career. The team did well, but more importantly, the crowd there was cheering really hard for all the athletes, not only for the home Canadians. And after our events, we went to the city and in the streets, people were celebrating, getting to know each other and talking to each other, no matter what was their background. It was just a very concrete example how sport bring people together. We're here together, and I think we can all agree on the fact that sport is a very powerful tool in order to do a lot of good things in the society. And that's 
the biggest things I want to say in bold. Uh, I was voted to the IOC AC in Pyeongchang 2018. And before that, uh, I had been a bit over 10 years uh, captain of the national teams. And through that, I had been starting to, already during my career, to voice the opinions of the athletes to the coaches and also to the federations. Coming from a female team sports, which especially 10 to 20 years ago didn't get that many, that much media attention, means that I know how it is to speak to an audience that is not really willing to listen to you. Yet I think it is essential to listen to athletes in order to improve the whole sporting world. Uh, of course, like Jens mentioned in the beginning, there are going to be different opinions within athletes. There are different roles. Brendan was talking about how important it is to have things for the professional athletes, yet there are athletes that are paying for themselves. So it's inevitable that there's going to be disagreements between athletes, and I don't even think that it is a bad thing. What I think is crucial is that, is that we are able to have a constructive discussion within the sporting world, and there is a dialogue going on. A constructive discussion uh, contribution from athletes to organizations is also crucial, I think. Han mentioned about that you need to be, athletes need to be more in the mix of making the sausage, and I think that is totally true. James mentioned earlier that currently in the IOC, there's an athlete rep in all the different commissions, and when a working group is formed, there's always an athlete rep. And in order to be able to really make the, shape the decision, I think it's very important that the athletes are voicing their opinions. I think it's our responsibility to say what we have to say while we are at those tables, because otherwise we're not contributing, we're not doing the job, and we're not showing the organization that athletes are something that are useful, that they should be listened to, you, listened to because they're actually contributing. I am. Myself, for instance, part of the Beijing 2020 Coordination Commission, and it's a very concrete position to be able to affect what the game's time experience is going to be for the athletes. Also, the legacy part of the event, which is constantly, must be constantly improved in order for the sport to stay strong. Uh, Another important aspect there is that throughout that we've been able to emphasize to the organizing committee how important it is to involve current, recently re retired, and former athletes to the actual organizing committee to do that work. In the 2017 launch IOC Athletes Commission strategy, uh, there are two roles that the IOC Athletes Commission has. There's a role for the athletes and a role within the Olympic movement. The first pillar is to empower athletes to be athlete representatives, and the second pillar is to support athletes with their sporting and non-sporting lives. And by emphasizing the fact, I think, that we need to help to create positions where athletes can get into, empower the athletes coming part of the organizing committee for them to become athlete represented, representatives and also to empower and show the organizing committee, the local organizations that it's important to actually have athletes and they are going to benefit from that. And also supporting the athletes with their sporting life by creating the best possible games time experience and supporting the athletes with their non-sporting lives with helping them get a start for their career maybe, or get experience within the organization committee. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, two quick things I'm going to pick out there then. Uh, the first point is power is always unequally distributed, and it's no different in athlete power. Uh, Han picked out uh, disability sports. You picked out women's sports, and there are lots of other categories. So we need to bear in mind those differently positioned statuses. And um, 
Maybe we need to think about how different sports are exposed to media in ways that others aren't, which diminish their power, especially economic. Rob. Thanks, Mike. I'm, uh, Rob Keeler. I was the former Deputy Director General of the World Anti-Doping Agency, and now I represent an organization called Global Athlete. I'm the Director General. I wanted to just comment on a few things that were said on the panel, uh, which I fully agree with, in terms of James and Emma, that every athlete should have a voice and should be listened to and has the ability to speak up. I think that's crucial in terms of athletes and the ability to have a voice. Brendan, I couldn't agree more with you in terms of the whole idea of moving forward in a, in a collective bargaining approach for athlete representation. And I think what was mentioned is sport brings people together, and Emma said this, and it has the power to really do really special things globally. And because of that, I think sport needs to be held to a higher accountability. And I'm going to be a little bit provocative in terms of some of the things I'm going to say. Everything I say today has nothing to do with the athletes because I believe the athletes have every right to speak up and speak loud, and that is their right. But I think the structure in the Olympic movement is enabling a power imbalance. The structure of athlete commissions is enabling a power imbalance. I'll tell you why. And this is not at the athletes at all, but athletes are being forced into positions at times to do things they don't want to do. And I'll give you concrete examples. In 2017, in August, Becky Scott made a statement in the media in terms of Russia. Two days later, the chair and the vice chair of the IOC Athlete Commission criticized her in the media. That is limiting the athlete's voice. The Global Athlete Forum in 2018, and I learned this after I've left WADA, but the 2018 Global Athlete Forum, which was held in Calgary, the leaders of the Olympic movement contacted continental athlete representations to send letters in advance to undermine the outcomes of the forum. Athletes put in a very difficult position, not fair. We have the United States Athlete Commission, Athlete Advisory Council, who wanted to make a statement on Russia, shut down. Most recently, I've learned that the WADA Athlete Committee wanted to make a statement on the Nike Oregon project, shut down. They also want to make comments on Russia, shut down. If we want to value and empower the athlete's voice, let's do that. Let's not silence them. And I think moving forward, we need to have a really lo strong look at how we move forward in athlete representation. The current structure doesn't work. It doesn't allow athletes to have a collective voice to speak openly and to allow their power of their representation to stand for tough issues and not have the fear of retribution because it's real. And you talk to any athlete that has spoken up, that has spoken strong and gone against the organizations that they represent, the, rep the, the retribution is real, it's true, and it happens. Statistically, sorry, through a survey, it was proven three years ago, 4,500 athletes responded, and one of the main reasons they do not speak up is because of the fear of retribution. It needs to stop. And that's why moving forward, I think we need to take a step back, not pretend we are something we're not, and really look at how we can work as a community for athletes, to find how athletes can be strongly represented and empower their voices and their opinions and bring them a part of a decision-making process. It doesn't make sense for me when we look at what's happening right now in terms of the WADA Athlete Committee, where the chair is being nominated or being elected, but yet the athlete that wants to run for the chair of the Athlete Committee has to get a nomination from the government and the Olympic movement side of board members of WADA. But yet, they're representing athletes and there's no nomination from other athletes? Again, a power and struggle and a power imbalance. 
So I think taking time, having honest and open discussions, and being true to everybody on how we can make this stronger for athletes is what we need to do moving forward. I don't have all the answers, but I think collectively we can get there. Thank you. I'll take your role. So just, just again, pick out one or two things there. One is about empowerment, disempowerment, and if we're to empower, what do we do to protect athletes once we've empowered them? Okay, great. Uh, the second point you've picked out, what, what kinds of endorsements are required? Why is there any endorsement required outside of the athlete community if it's a body for the athletes? Okay, that brings us finally then uh, to our last speaker, Ashley. Uh, floor is yours. Thanks. My name is Ashley Lubri. I'm the executive director of Athletes Can. I was a figure skater, competitive figure skater for about 18 years. I never made the national team, but I did get the opportunity to train with Olympians. Um, after that, I, I worked with the NHL um, in the league office, then moved to Australia to work with the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, where I met the president of Athletes Can at the time. So I moved back to Canada and started there in 2006. I've been with Athletes Can for 13 years now. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you about Athletes Can. Uh, we're the most inclusive athlete association in Canada and the first of its kind in the world. I'm very excited to see other independent athlete associations begin to pop up. We did help uh, in the founding of the British Athletes Commission in the early 2000s and uh, look forward to working with Athletes Germany and also the US uh, group as well as they strive forward for independence as well. Um, our organization was founded in 1992 by athletes for athletes, uh, similar to Athletes Germany. Uh, it was born out of the ben Johnson, ben Johnson doping scandal and subsequent uh, Dubin inquiry. And athletes really had a different perspective than the Canadian Olympic Association at the time. Uh, and they wrote a position paper that outlined the power imbalance between athletes and NSOs at the time, and that paper was buried. So a group of athletes decided that they needed to find another way to have the athletes voice heard and the only way that they could effectively influence policy um, and affect change in sport was through an independent body and that's where the Canadian Athletes Association was created, um, now known today as Athletes Can. So what did we do in the early years? Uh, there was a lot of wins. It was a really controversial time. Um, women's rights, there was funding for female athletes that uh, were pregnant. Uh, initially, it was seen as an injury and they were their funding was withdrawn. We changed that. Um, increased direct funding to athletes for living and training stipends and expenses. Um, more, represent, more representation within governance. So there was a shift um, in the early years where Sport Canada actually built athlete representation and meaningful athlete engagement into the governance structures of sport. And this was mandated as part of their um, sport funding accountability framework. It didn't go as far as to say you must have an athlete on your board of directors, but it did say that you need to have athlete representation within your decision-making structures. So how do we work as an association? Um, our structure is actually similar to professional players associations in that we have athlete reps in every sport. Uh, as an organization, we represent over 2,500 active senior national team athletes in Canada competing at the Olympics, Paralympics, Commonwealth, Pan, Pair, Pan American Games, uh, and Senior World Championships. So we have an athlete rep, at least one athlete rep in every sport. In, in a lot of cases, we have male, female athletes, we have able-bodied and para-athletes, and we have athletes in every discipline. Um, once a year, we bring all of those athletes together uh, at our Athletes Can Forum. We just hosted our 27th annual Athletes Can Forum this year, and that's where our athletes come together to talk about current issues in sport, what they see as priorities for the organization, and to elect their leadership. So as I said, our, our organization is athlete-led for the athletes. Our board of directors is made up completely of athletes. Um, anyone that is a member of Athletes Can is free to run for a position on the board of directors, and our members elect those uh, through a pretty rigorous election process. Um, outside of that, uh, we work with our partners, so the existing athlete representation and voices within the system, like the COCAC and the CPCAC, Commonwealth Games reps, 
Um, and we're pretty, co pretty collaborative, I would say. Um, we have definitely drawn some lines in the sand where um, if it's an Olympic issue and the COCAC wants to take it on, we back off. Where they want to collaborate, we join in. And where they say, this is a little bit too controversial for, for us to handle, but this is how we feel, we take that on and we drive it in the system. Um, in terms of actual outputs of the organization um, over the years, we've also, similarly to a players association, we've collectively bargained a standardized athlete agreement for all sports in Canada and our, and our government. Sport Canada has actually just recently adopted that into policy, so sports are now mandated to use this template, which provides a very fair and responsive agreement for athletes. Um, we conducted a maltreatment study recently, which 1,000 Canadian athletes responded to, 95% of which um, indicated that they experienced some form of maltreatment. We're working as a key stakeholder in the, in the safe sport movement in Canada to address that. We signed the Universal Declaration of Player Rights in 2018 that was spearheaded by World Players Association. And we became an intervener in the Castor Semenya uh, case at CAS based on human rights and um, athlete harm. And I want to just say that we may be a national association, but when there are issues that are happening internationally that impact our athletes, we're definitely going to take a stand on it. And we've recently been working with other international independent associations, along with World Players Association, to address those at a higher level and really engage the athlete voice globally. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So thank you for reminding us of the precariousness or the kind of intrinsic vulnerability of athlete labor. Uh, I think you really brought that out very, very nicely. Uh, I should say that I neglected to pick out a really important point that Emma mentioned, which is the idea of quotas. What level of representation should we be striving for in which sports? Um, and one thing nobody mentioned was the role of agents. Love them or loathe them, they're, they're, they're here to stay. Uh, so that would be interesting. Well, I promised you 40 minutes, and we have almost exactly 40 minutes. <clears throat> Who's going to start us off? Thank you very much. Hello, Nikki Dryden. Um, my question is for James and Emma. So you, both of you talked a lot about um, the importance of having athlete representation on the IOC. but. The Oath of Allegiance specifically says that you, as IOC members, are to promote in all circumstances the interests of the International Olympic Committee. I argue that those interests are in direct conflict with athletes. Um, and so my question to you is, is your representation on the IOC merely symbolic? Do you actually go to the working groups that look at the cities? I believe there was a meeting in LA to look at the um, LA 2028. There was no athletes there. Thank you very much, it's a really sharp question there. But the key phrase, I think you're gonna to need to repeat it for the whole audience to be with you. So can you read out the oath again, which you take to be a conflict of interest? Um, so the IOC, as an IOC member, your oath is to promote in all circumstances the interests of the International Olympic Committee. Your responsibility is not as an athlete representative. How you. do you balance those two conflicting things? Uh, given that the athletes make up the Olympic, the Olympic Games, I don't think they're, well, I think they're fairly fundamental to the Olympic Games. So I think they're one, in, uh, on one hand, they're one and the same thing. Um, and yes, we do turn up. And yes, we are very, very active. And I know uh, Rob was talking about fear of retribution. There's, I certainly have not experienced that. I won't speak on behalf of Emma. But certainly uh, in all of those working groups, yeah, there's a huge amount of input. I mean, we don't, we don't go from being an athlete to being a, an IOC member and all of a sudden just change, change our tune. We are there for athletes and we try and represent them as well as we possibly can. Athletes are a massive part of the Olympic movement. They are the heart of the Olympic movement. So, yeah, we, we, we're doing our best. We're doing our best and we think we're doing a pretty good job. Can I, uh, can I ask if, if you want to come in, Emma? Yeah. Yeah, no, just going on to that, I think it's not that if the IOC is not doing well, that would be the benefit for the athletes or the other way around. So I think that in order to make it as strong, 
make it better, we need to be there inside and be part of the process of making it better. So I think, just like James mentioned, that I think the stronger the IOC or the games part, the better job is done. I think the athletes benefit from that too. And the IOC is not going to benefit if the athletes are not doing well. I'm just going to sharpen this question a little bit because as put, uh, you expressed it as an intrinsic conflict of interest. You're either on one side or the other. But there can be mutuality, but I guess it's not going to be complete mutuality. There's easily going to be conflict somewhere else. Does somebody on the panel want to pick that up? Huh. And then Brenda. Sorry. <laughs> so this, this is something that uh, we've been talking a lot in the United States as well because the same sort of thing had been implying on the board of directors of the NOC. And, and my opinion is that there is quite a bit of mutuality, but I do agree that in some, in some ways, because of the way the system is set up, there's inherently some sort of conflict or adversarial relationship with certain issues. Um, the system only works the way it does because the athletes are willing to give up certain rights to the system, in my opinion. Right? This is where Rule 40, Rule 50, all of those things come about, and the athletes generally have agreed that some of those are appropriate, but to your point, I personally feel that there, there is inherently some of these areas where there's, there has to be give and take, there has to be negotiation, and so I don't have all the solutions, but I, I tend to agree have with you the got a really good Have you got a really good case, though? Can you give us one really sharp example to move the debate on? Yeah, so uh, Rule 50 is a really good example. Rule 50 is a really good example because we've seen this most recently. I've seen it at the Pan Am Games uh, that athletes uh, have to agree that uh, we all agree that in order to have this platform where we can r really, you know, feel the power of sport unifying us all, that we're going to give up some of our freedom of expression in order uh, to promote that platform. Uh, and, and so inherently you are giving up some of those rights. So I think in some cases where People may not agree where, you know, the, the, the IOC may prim primarily be looking at how do we achieve the best, best platform for everybody, not only the athletes, but also sponsors and other stakeholders. I think the athletes may, may sometimes have a slightly different perspective. And there can be overlap, but I think there inherently will be conflict. Okay. Can I, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great discussion, and we, at the forum, um, for all of those in the room that were at the forum uh, earlier this year, we had a, a really robust discussion around uh, the funding model. And it was interesting to hear all the different points of view. And, and you're so right, Hans, it's, there's so many um, uh, nuances where negotiation has to occur in Rule 40 uh, around, or around the whole funding uh, model of the Olympic movement. It's so difficult because, I th as I said in my opening remarks, you know, you're dealing with very complex, very well managed, very well structured uh, National Olympic Committees to the complete opposite and ones that rely solely on funding to actually get to the Games. And so it is really, really complex. And uh, my own Olympic Committee, the Australian Olympic Committee, uh, it relies solely on sponsorship and foundation, no government funding whatsoever. So the protection of those, um, those rights is really, really important, as opposed to maybe another National Olympic Committee who is completely funded by government, you know, those, those uh, protections aren't quite as, as important. Okay, Brendan, then I'm going to gentlemen at the back. Look, I think the conflict of interest is evident in the answers to the questions, you know. Um, the reality is that we need to introduce some knowledge into this conversation, okay? So if we introduce some facts-based evidence and we look at athlete representation over history, what we know is where the athletes get organised, they can get their heads around all of these issues, revenue sharing, what should go to game development, what should go to athlete salaries, what should go to running and marketing the game. We can resolve all of these issues. What do we invest in athlete development and wellbeing? What in infrastructure? These issues have been negotiated. Rule 40, it's just an image rights clause. It's negotiated in every collective bargaining agreement in different ways all around the world. It's not that hard. Rule 40 is not a t one of the Ten Commandments. It's just a rule. Rule 50. It's really easy stuff. 
The problem is all of these answers are coming through the paradigm of the Olympic movement. What does the Olympic movement want? The first question has to be what do the athletes want and need? It's as simple as that. Take a step back and then introduce knowledge, track record. The IOC Athletes Commission was set up in 1980. It hasn't asked for the athletes to get paid yet. Brendan, I'm going to... James tells Brendan, me the athletes Brendan, don't Brendan, work. Brendan, just no, one sorry, second, Mike. Sorry, sorry. Athletes... T sorry, Brendan, I've got, I'm just going to say, oh, I'm going to let you finish, but there are four people already waiting and I'm struggling to hold on to the queue, so... No, I appreciate that. But uh, the... <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go, I'll let you go. Thank you very you, much. Yeah. Tim at the back. Uh, Tarek Panja from the New York Times. Um, just for the, for the athletes there, those on the, on the, on the IOC Commission and, and others, um, over, I was at the Pyeongchang Games and I, I was at the IOC Hotel. Um, fair to say it was the best hotel in the village. Um, none of the athletes were staying there. Um, I spoke to a man who said he was staying there for 30 days. He might go to one or two events. Uh, senior IOC member, been there for a long time. So I said, what are you here for? He said, well, you know, look around. And he was conducting a lot of business. His, his, it was good for his own business. Now, when you're part of this organization and you said, it's about the athletes, without the athletes, it doesn't exist. How do you square that with these lifestyles that have been kind of normalized over decades? And it's not just the IOC, we look at FIFA and other um, um, governing bodies like that. Why don't you guys speak up? Why don't you guys try and change that culture? And that's speaking to something David Howman talked about earlier as well. There is a culture within these sports organizations that this is what it's supposed to be like. And it's people like you who are supposed to change this. So are you doing anything about that? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely spot on. And as David said, um, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a, you know, hopefully it's not a generational thing. And, um, you know, age is a great thing. Uh, so, yeah, I agree 100%. You want people there for the right reasons, for the, with the right capabilities, doing the right job. And that's the goal, to try and, try and achieve that. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact that there's more and more athletes getting involved in decision making, um, pushing through agenda, I think that's really key. And eventually, those sorts of people are weeded out. Okay, um, yes. Can you put your hand up and wave? No, you're afterwards, I'm afraid. You're next. If there's another microphone around, that will speed things up. You ready to go? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Annette Greenhow. I'm from Bond University on the go sunny Gold Coast, which is a long way from here, but it's great to be here. And thank you very much for the diversity of thought that's coming from you all in regard to the various forms of athletes' representative organisations. One of the questions I've got just particularly relates to younger athletes. That um, We've heard, obviously, there's inherent vulnerabilities of athletes. Um, there's obviously very clear information asymmetries that exist as well. But just about the young athletes, I'm wondering, do any of you engage with um, athletes who are non, not adults, that they're under the age of 18, um, that they're recognised as minors, um, particularly in light of the fact that there have been some significant instances of maltreatment, particularly when they're younger, and the vulnerability is so much more enhanced? Rob first, uh, Brendan after. Oh. I think uh, I'll take it. Take it sport. Um, our membership, obviously, gymnastics, figure skating, a number of sports have um, minors, so we definitely represent those athletes. We work with the sport organizations, their parents, to make sure that the information that we're getting to them is also going through their parents. Um, in terms of vulnerability, our maltreatment study did go out to all of our members and we did capture information on that. I just want to to stay on topic for this. We are presenting on that maltreatment study on Wednesday afternoon, so you'll get more information there. Right. 
I, I agree, Vash. Um, we're part of that. Uh, Andrea Florence is here from Well Players you know, Association. We're doing a major research piece at the moment into the vulnerabilities of young athletes. We're doing that through researching the childhood experience of current elite athletes. Part of the problem is that the representative network doesn't kick in until players have come through that system. And so the best service is only available and they're the ones that have tended to have, uh, we would assume, a positive childhood experience. So we certainly need to look at that. The, the thing about this is norms. S sport likes to say it's different and it's special. And, therefore, and it is. Um, but there's also um, a, a danger associated with that. And if you look at the situation with the US gymnastics and the Ropes and Gray report, that says that sport um, normalised, and I'm paraphrasing, pain and suffering as an essential aspect of sporting success um, for children. And so therefore, that's why we do need to take a step back and, and look at, again, just to repeat, look at these very much from the uh, paradigm of the child and the rights of the child under UN conventions, which is informing us, because that's the challenge we have in giving the child a voice. And, um, and, and it's not, and as we often know, that can even create a conflict with the chi child's parents because of the dream that uh, that, that parent is often uh, championing. Uh, well said. So we have Lady the back of the room, then the gentleman in the middle, guy to the left, and then in the middle. Is Laura Robinson from Canada, and my question too is for Emma and James. And I'm sure you know um, athletes around the world are coming forward now about historical sexual abuse uh, and its uh, epidemic levels. And I'm wondering what you too will do for those athletes. Will you set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission so their voices can actually be heard? Uh, and especially, you know, for Emma, given that a lot of those women who had to endure what they endured uh, were actually also opening the doors for women from your generation. So what will you do so we can hear those athletes, their voices? Emma, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, I think it is very important that we offer a place that these athletes can come forward, can come safely uh, uh, forward. And I think it kind of goes with the previous question too, that with the young athletes, with the current young athletes, we need to be very aware that we need to educate them. With the Olympic movement, there's a youth Olympic games, there's a lot of education about the abuse and sexual abuse so that the group of athletes that might not get that exposure for the education at their homes will get it somewhere. And I think that nationally, we need to emphasize national federations, national Olympic committees, so that it will be kind of close enough that we can get a reach where these athletes can come forward with these issues. They're very sensitive issues, so we need to make sure that we have, or we create and improve the ways that they can do it without fear of their sensitive things being dealt with the wrong way. Is anybody gonna pick up on this idea of a truth and reconciliation process? A, tr a truth and reconciliation? Uh, yes, I think it's still important that we deal with that also for those athletes and also in order to learn from the experiences that they had before that it would not be repeated in the same way in the future. So yes, I think that we need to be improved ways of dealing with those and helping those people to come forward. Which agencies are empowered to continue that dialogue is gonna be an interesting question. Because one thing I've already learned in this session is there are so many stakeholders in this space. It is far from clear to me who we should assign responsibility to for which issue. Okay, you've been waiting a good while. Thank you very much.
Yeah, my name's uh, Daryl Adair. I'm from uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Um, it seems to me that um, athlete representation is not simply a question of voice, but one of power. And it seems to me the gold standard in terms of athletes having power is, in fact, collective bargaining, which currently is um, associated only with the uh, professional commercial sports. Um, so I'm wondering um, what prospects there are for collective bargaining in the uh, Olympic movement and whether you'd actually be receptive to the kinds of uh, skills and resources that an organisation like World Players might be able to bring to bear in the Olympic movement. Brendan. Is the question for me? Yeah, I think sorry, it was more for the Olympic <laughs> movement. Yeah, I think it's more for James and Emma. <coughs> We're available, though. So I'm going to offer, offer it to Rob as well, though. <laughs> Either you can take it. Yeah, Rob. You want me to answer it? Yeah, please. Are we direct, I think he directed it to you, yeah? Peter? Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a bigger issue here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to answer your question, but the whole sport community, and it goes to the previous question, um, it's crisis-based and it's band-aid solution for everything. Let's run, a, let's run a, an investigation, let's come up with recommendations, we're going to do it, something called Agenda 2020 or other things that are being done, and nothing's ever really done. Let's be very frank. Um, the same with if you're, if, you're, if you're in the environment, you're afraid to do everything possible to try to make it different. And I'll give you an example, and I'm going off on a little tangent, I'm gonna come right back. A, the president of, of Sport Accord, Marius Weiser, who was also the president of judo, spoke up in a forum in Russia and put his position on what he thought the Olympic movement should be. And part of that speech talked about empowerment of athletes and what, is, what the things are going wrong. What happened after that? International federations lined up one by one, signed a declaration or, uh, uh, to, to have ask him to resign. So the fair of retribution not only happens with athletes, it happens within the whole community. So that's where I think, and, I, and I, you talk about the collective. I think, and it's proven as, as Brendan has, has, has said, the, the power of a collective bargaining will not hurt sport. It will grow sport beyond its current mandates. And it will ensure that athletes have invested interest to make sure they grow it along with the owners or the Olympic movement or the international federations. And to me, you start losing that imbalance. And if you have a 50% say on decisions that are being made that affect you, that power imbalance starts to change. And if you look at all the abuse issues that happen in sport, if you look at all the problems that happen in sport, why? Power imbalance. That's what it's because of. Moritz, I'm you, haven't, you haven't been asked a question yet, but I'm going to offer you a space to jump in if you want to. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, basically, big parts of the, of the question is, have already been answered. Um, I, would like to, I would like to add maybe that um, from our point of view, it's, um, it's important and it's valuable to keep in mind what the athlete is really seeking for. So is it really... Um, is it really the money? Is it uh, the bargaining that is, uh, that is worth a lot for the athlete? Or does um, what the athlete need much more consist of several aspects to it? So I've just um, touched slightly uh, on the point that personal development al also plays an, a huge role in the, I would, I would want to say, in the, in the level of satisfaction for the athlete throughout his whole career and beyond the career. So um, from the perspective of our association athlete in Deutschland, we would not only um, want to talk about the money, um, also about the money, as we have done, um, but there are several more aspects to, to answering this question um, in a complete way. The only difficulty with the idea of using a criterion like what would satisfy the athletes is the phenomenon called adaptive preference formation. Um, some people are prepared to put up with an awful lot less. Uh, as Martha Nussbaum found when she interviewed the quality of life of women toiling in manual labor in, in East Asia. They actually lived happier lives according to the scales than lots of people who had higher economic standards elsewhere. Why? Because they were prepared to put up with a lot of crap. So, so it's an interesting criteria. What criteria are you going to use? Okay, Ashley. 
Um, I just wanted to jump in on that. Uh, in Canada, uh, there was a recent decision by the BC Labour Board, BC is a province of Canada, um, that said that Rugby Sevens team was in fact found to be employees of Rugby Canada. And so that um, decision has now been appealed and now it's at provincial court. Um, and the national sport organizations of our country, I think about 40 of them have banded together to submit as, as much um, letters, phone calls, emails about how this is gonna be uh, the biggest mistake for, for sport in Canada um, to professionalize amateur sport. And so that conversation, actual collective bargaining is happening already. Um, the movement is driving towards it. Our standardized athlete agreement is just a step in that direction as a whole, as a collective, but when you're looking at 60 different sports, team, summer, winter, individual, male, female, you're looking at so many different perspectives. So it's very hard to collectively bargain for, for that many athletes. Sports specifically, I think it's much more possible and we're seeing that happen. Uh, I'm Faraz Shalai from Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. Uh, Mr. Schwab, you uh, referred to the international human rights law in your presentation. <laughs> because uh, uh, athletes are primarily human, so they're subject to international human rights protections. Uh, do you think that, isn't it better to consider the, the protection of the athletes' rights in that framework? Like, we have uh, international mechanisms to protect the human rights uh, under the mandate of United Nations, for example. and. The Human Rights Committee recently had a general comment on the right to assembly, uh, which you mentioned in your presentation. Were there any efforts to use this framework to promote the athletes' rights or not? Well, there's been profound efforts, and not just to promote the human rights of athletes, but world players has worked with the Sport and Rights Alliance, which includes Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the big unions, to promote the human rights of everyone affected by sport because the tragedy has been mega sporting events such as the World Cup and the Olympic Games, which should be a force for good, have been associated with um, horrendous human rights abuse. And so if we look at something like the International Olympic Committee, which in many ways is in a privileged position of being able to operate above and beyond national law, especially with the backing of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, then we do need to ask ourselves what are the minimum standards of governance that we expect of such a body that we're giving such privilege to. Sure, we don't want corruption, we need ethical behaviour, but we believe that respect for internationally recognised human rights is non-negotiably one of those um, criteria. Um, and those rights include the right to freedom of association and the right to organise and collectively uh, bargain. And so these sports really need to do four things, and FIFA's done it, and I saw Federico here from FIFA, who's one of the leaders in this space. Uh, they've got a binding human rights policy backed up in the Constitution. We need to do the same in the Olympic Charter. The Olympic Charter needs a new fundamental principle of Olympism, and that is that it respect internationally recognised human rights. This means that an IOC has to use its leverage to proactively take steps to prevent the abuse and the harm that we're dealing with. There needs to be access to remedy, and the IOC should be tracking and monitoring, and not just the IOC, all international sports bodies, I don't want to single them out, because they have made some important progress. For example, human rights commitments in the host city contract. Um, but we also need to transparently know, and the IOC needs to know where it's at, and so does WADA, Rob, in relation to the human rights impacts of its activities. Okay, we have one question in the middle, Hugh. This will work. Um, I think we've heard some nice uh, uh, ways going forward by, by everybody. Uh, my question is more, we've heard what bodies can do. Uh, what can we do as athletes? Um, I think my question would be at Brendan, uh, Rob and James. Are we willing to discuss things among each other and maybe say, okay, maybe our way is not the only way? James, do you want to kick off? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, and, and you know, great comment and great question. Um, I think I, I think I mentioned at the outset that we're all in, we're all here 
for the you know the purpose of sport and um, and allowing the athlete's voice to raise to rise. Um, we all represent different different bodies. You know, a lot of Olympians they don't make any money. They pay. I, I've paid to go and represent the country on many occasions. Uh, so you've got professional sports, uh, professional sports people who are working for an organisation uh, based on profit, and you know, there's a huge amount of, of uh, money involved. And then at the other extreme, those athletes that are rely, relying solely on government funding or, or, or funding from their sport to actually uh, get to a game. So yeah, there are many ways and we, all, we should all work very, very closely together to try and work out uh, the best way forward. And this, you know, it's so diverse. But as I said, it, um, in the outset, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect model. There's no such thing as a perfect race. We keep on, we should, all of us keep striving to find that. I'm afraid to say I have six questions and I have strict instructions to finish in five minutes. And I think out of respect for the, uh, the queue, which have been waiting quite a long time, I'll just ask you to put your points in a single uh, sentence, if you can, please. Nice and sharp. I have the mic. Did I get my mic? <laughs> Go on, then you have the <laughs> mic. <laughs> Bring the other mic forward, then. Go on ahead, quickly, if you can. I know I'm, I'm cutting in line. I'm sorry, but I got the mic, so... Um, First question, I have the, sorry, my name is Paulina Tomczyk from EU Athletes. Okay, so just one question then. I have the impression to the IOC members that you are talking about athletes not being paid for their job, or is it a noble thing, as they are heroes because they're not being paid to represent their countries. Do you think it's wrong for, for athletes to be paid for the years of work um, and all the dedication that they are giving to represent their country? I think it's uh, I think it's either for Emma or, or, or for you, James. Either one. One answer, though. No, I do not think that it's wrong to think that athletes are entitled to get paid for what they are doing. We need to find out in a way who is paying for their work, uh, for what w work. I mean, what part? Because we also need to. Bear in mind that what are we going to, where are we going to take it away if we put something else. I think athletes do deserve to get compensation, but we need to find a place where, where they get the compensation from. And I think it's going to vary between the professional athletes that come to represent their country in an international world championship tournament or an Olympic tournament or if it's an athlete that is not getting paid from anyone where else. Okay, nice and brief to the next question, then I will come to the front. Mike, Mike you, you, you challenged us with the diversity of representation across the athlete world, but, but actually I don't mind the, the diversity. It doesn't always do as good. What we actually need is to be able to bring governing bodies, international federations, IOC to book with the law, because what prevents the retribution, what prevents the power imbalance is when I can call on the law. I can't call on the law in the UK. I cannot take a governing body to a ju judicial review. We can't do that. It's about the law. I can live with the diversity. I must be able to grapple with uh, okay. the sport. Okay, thank the you. Law. I'll take that as a comment, not a question. Thank you very much. To the front. I have a question to the two IOC members on the podium. I really have a hard time under to understand what you mean with participation and decision making in the IOC as athletes. I r recall the IOC Athletes Forum where Thomas Bach had a two hour speech or a discussion with athletes and told you very clearly that he's against individual payments, that you should not follow people from, the, from outside the Olympic movement and that the team payment more or less via the IOCs is a good way. And then at the very end, there was a recommendation to the IOC or executive board and not a participation from the athletes. And the executive board can now decide how to uh, deal with the whole matter. And at the end, every NOC athletes commission worldwide gets, gets a $10,000 payment every year. To be honest, that sounds like a very, very old sports policy, very usual, like I know it from, from Thomas Bach since decades. So I ask you now clearly, 
do you think that this is participation of athletes in decision making? James, you get the answer, and then I'm going to finish with a gentleman with his hand up now, and I apologize to those who are still waiting. Uh, yes, I, yes, I do think it is, absolutely. And you'll also recall at that forum that the athlete representatives wanted support to actually run as effective athlete commissions. I think you remember that, and I think that's where that funding goes. As Emma said in her piece, uh, to, to help empower those athlete leaders, they need support. A lot of them need support. They don't all come from the US or Australia or Canada. Um, so that's the idea of that funding. But German athletes were not I'm allowed really to sorry, talk I'm really sorry, I'm going to go to the last question because we've been waiting a long time, then I have to go to the speakers. Niels Nigard, NOC President uh, of Denmark. Thank you for some very good presentations and very important discussion. If you look at the presentations, we have at least five different approaches to how athletes should be represented. And I'd like to ask a concrete question to Morris. Why is it that uh, athletes of Germany cannot go together with the uh, uh, German Athletes Commission, uh, the DOSB Athletes Commission? So at least there you could coordinate it, your forces because we need much more coordination. Thank you. To, um, to, be sh to make sure, the question was why we cannot coordinate with which other athletes commission? Oh, of DOSB you said and you said United States, so DOSB, yeah. We are, we are connecting and we have grown out of a connection of both. So there is the connection already. So the, the only question is, um, how do we have to, how do we split up our work? But the basics of representing athletes will, with all the important aspects from our perspective that are in this, um, they exist, they're existing already. So whatever name is written on top of it. Okay, I hope you forgive me if I didn't get to your question. There were lots of people, I've asked the panel to say in one sentence what's the most important thing to do now. I'll give you two or three commas, no colons, no semicolons. Starting with Ashley at the left. Pressure. Um, I would say, I just use this moment to say to all the media and the journalists in the room, you have a really big role to play in bringing the athlete voice forward. And don't be afraid to tell the stories of those unnamed athletes who are too afraid to come out in public because of retribution, fear of retribution. Because that is a that exists. There are associations here that can help put you in touch with those athletes, but they're ready to talk. Thank you. Change or be changed. The athlete movement's on the rise. Be a part of the solution. Don't be a part of the problem. Find a goal that you want to get to, and from here, talk to at least one person that how are you gonna get there together, kind of collaborating with somebody else. We are already seeing and experiencing the process of athletes emancipating. Um, let's support, embrace, and um, respect it. That's gonna be positive for the whole sports world in the end. Thank you. Um, the athletes, we have a value at World Players called legacy. That is that we play it forward, that we need to create a better environment for the generation that follows. There are generations of athletes that have sacrificed to create the situation which the player associations have. Those lessons are there. We, uh, we encourage all new athletes, all emerging athletes to learn from those lessons so that they can share in the wealth of their sport and grow sport for the mutual benefit. James. Yeah, it's very similar comments, just keep striving. We're all, uh, we're all in here for the same thing. Keep working together, keep the dialogue, and it's great to hear the different organisations um, of DSO, DOSB and Matthias' organisation working together. And the more we can do that, the better the result's going to be. Like any competition, like any athlete, just keep striving. No pressure now, Han. <laughs> come up with a clincher. I think both, both organisations and athletes really need to start treating all athletes uh, not as children or as threats, uh, but more like partners 
uh, more like the useful data, the useful information that they provide regardless of their opinion and give all of the athletes the respect that they deserve. Well, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, can I thank you? Can I thank you for your excellent questions and would you please put your hands together for an excellent panel? Thank you. I would also like to, to thank you all for uh, igniting this discussion and kickstarting it because bear in mind, even if we did not conclude or get all the answers now, we will discuss similar issues over a number of sessions in the days to come. So those of you who, who did not uh, uh, get the opportunity to raise a question, there will be time. Meanwhile, while uh, our uh, panel pick up their bribes uh, and tokens of recognition at the, at the end of the room, um, I would like uh, the next panel to start moving forward. Um, Mary Harvey is there and uh, I think the name uh, the signs will also be changed.